What's going on guys, this is Rob, and if you're enjoying the content that I'm uploading onto my channel, then feel free to subscribe, and you can also offer suggestions on topics and characters and storylines and whatnot that we can have discussions on uh, later on in this channel. So with DC doing their big four-part crossover this week, I wanted to try to see if I couldn't capitalize on the whole search relevance of, of Green Arrow because he's still pretty popular right now. But in truth, you know, what the aspects of the show that are highlighting how awesome Green Arrow is pale in comparison to the work of Benjamin Percy on the, the comic book series. So, um, you know, this comes out of Green Arrow Rebirth. And of course, we had talked about the one shot, the one that really set the stage for what was going on. And so as we go through this first issue, a lot of this is really just Benjamin Percy refreshing us with where things stand at the moment. Because remember, and Green Arrow Rebirth number one, that one focused on the introduction of the underground men. Now, this was actually pretty interesting when it came to the Green Arrow mythos because for a lot of people, you know, during the uh, Jeff Lemire and Sorrentino run of Green Arrow in the New 52, a lot of people looked at him as though DC was effectively trying to recreate Batman. And even then, with the Green Arrow TV show, people tried to recreate Batman. And a lot of things were lackluster when it came to his character. And the reason why I say that is because Green Arrow has a long running mythos in DC comics he's really one of the oldest characters that they have in their publication history granted dc has a lot of legacy characters like the core members of the justice league have been around since the 1950s you know so they've got 60 some odd years worth of history and some of them even predate the 1950s going as far back as the 30s and 40s and so because of this a lot of people look at the publication history of dc and say well if they have so many legacy characters you think it'd be easy to keep that legacy alive the problem with this is is trying to maintain interest while also trying to inject new things when green arrow first showed up way back in the the day he was effectively robin hood i mean that's really what he was he was designed to be a robin hood s character it wasn't until the era of neil adams and dennis o'neill in the 1970s i think it was when they did like snowbirds don't fly and stories like that that they started to move him away from being batman-esque and turning him uh, into a guy that was in a lot of ways the anti-batman the problem with this is that as time progressed his character fluctuated and it changed i mean we eventually got mike grell's longbow hunters and mike grell's green arrow run during the uh vertigo imprint which added a lot of adult oriented themes, but you couldn't have a mainstay character like Green Arrow confined to the Vertigo imprint instead. He had to be able to be rolled over into the Justice League. He had to be able to be rolled over into the main DC superhero roster, because even if he wasn't the most popular superhero of the time, he was a household name. People knew who he was, and so you couldn't just throw him into the realm of isolation and keep him there forever. And so when DC came back in 2011 and they launched the new 52, Green Arrow got a wholesale reboot, and people hated it. Fans hated it. And the reason why is because, like, like with the character of Black Canary. You know, going through this, when we pick up with this, this story, we effectively have Black Canary and we have Green Arrow going through and trying to find the Underground Man. Because remember, this is an organization that's not unlike the Court of Owls uh, in the sense that they are kidnapping people and they're basically sending them on, uh, really, in, in cargo freights to some place where they'll eventually be sold off. Now, we don't really know that the Court of Owls was doing something like that specifically, but we do know that the Court of Owls and the Parliament of Owls were both the Gotham City and International Organization, meaning they operated worldwide. What their own motivations were just seemed to be a consolidation of power unto themselves but the underground man function in a capacity that they're really just doing this to make money and we'll learn a lot more about them as we get you know further through this initial five issue run but with regards to the character of black canary of course i mean we, we have her fighting alongside oliver queen right now but when the new 52 launched black canary and oliver queen never met they didn't know each other or if they did meet i don't remember whether they actually ever really met before but i don't think they did but they certainly didn't have the same standard of relationship they had before the new 52 and that's what made people so mad is because the Green Arrow Black Canary concept dates all the way back to before Crisis on Infinite Earths. One of the reasons why Crisis on Infinite Earths was launched was to rectify the continuity issues between Black Canary, her mother, the daughter, you know, and the relationship they had with Oliver Queen to kind of clear that mess up. It was actually a really weird situation for a time. <laughs> he was basically dating the mother and the daughter at the same time. It was kind of strange. It was cool, but it was kind of strange. But the idea here was that when the New 52 launched, that because fans hated this notion, you know, DC did offer some solitary efforts you know they basically gave us uh you know john diggle in the comic book and you know even jeff lemire's run and uh, i guess jeff lemire and sorrentino's run wasn't terrible it just wasn't the green arrow that we knew it wasn't the oliver queen that we were used to and so because of this you know what happened with dc rebirth is it was uh, effectively dc coming back and saying okay you know you don't have the inexperienced oliver queen anymore you don't have the oliver queen that's trying to figure his place out anymore you have the oliver queen that has a strong understanding or reasonable understanding of what he's doing his morals are you know they 
he left leaves something to be desired in terms of the lengths he will go to to achieve his ends but in the end his heart is in the right place he's trying to do the best he can not only that we also got black canary back in a relationship or at least as close as the two get to a relationship with green arrow now the way that dc did this and again we talked about this in the green arrow uh the green arrow rebirth one shot what they did is they said okay look guys we recognize that black canary and oliver queen have never gotten together in the new 52 we can't pretend they did we can't just launch dc rebirth and pretend that the two of them got together somewhere along the line because if fans are going to see a restoration of the relationship they want to see how that happens they don't want to just suddenly see the two of them together with no explanation of what took place you know dc coming along and just saying well sometime you know during this one year window the two of them ended up getting together fans don't want to see that fans want to see the evolution and i want to see i don't know about you guys leave a comment and let me know but i want to see the evolution of oliver queen and black canary getting together because the relationship is so significant in dc comics you got you know you got superman and lois lane all right they're they're the the original comic book relationship you know superman the first hero the first superhero in comic books and uh lois lane you know the first lady of comics it makes sense that the two of them would just be like the top people but then you got peter parker you got mary jane watson or you got peter parker and gwen stacy if you're uh if you're old enough to remember that that era of comic books you've got uh batman and and catwoman to a degree really more batman and talia al ghul no but you have these relationships that kind of stand the test of time as defining the characters themselves and so seeing black canary back here is actually really cool now the funny thing about this is black canary you know because she was part of the new 52 because she was part of birds of prey alongside barbara gordon she had her own way of doing things and much of what she learned in terms of being a hero was tied into her own personal experiences but also tied into dealing with barbara gordon and barbara gordon as we know learned a lot of her lessons really at the knee of batman and so because of that you know black canary does not take the kind of route that oliver queen does oliver queen uses money to solve his problems i mean that's really what he does he just throws money at virtually everything he can if he needs information from cops he pays them off if he needs information from some guy working at a docks like in this situation here where they're trying to figure out what's going on with these underground men he just throws money at it now the funny thing about this and, and what we'll see in this story is that the loyalty that people have to oliver queen only lasts so long as the money lasts and when the money goes away their loyalty disappears as well and that's a very important and defining factor of what benjamin percy is doing with establishing oliver queen in this dc rebirth line of stories not only that we also get a pretty new creation by benjamin percy as far as i'm aware we get the introduction or at least the first few mentions of something called the ninth circle now but from here we also switch back you know once they once they get the information they need or at least once they pay off this dock worker to basically say look you know if anybody unsavory comes showing up here do what they tell you to do but i want to know before you tell anybody else and so switching back to the apartment of oliver queen we again get this little bit of uh, involvement between himself and black canary but again they're not officially you know in the the serious level of a relationship they were in before the new 52 but it's getting there you know it's 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 working its way up to that position which of course i'm also glad to see but you know lest we forget we're also met with the reintroduction or i guess the re-emergence of amiko now amiko to be honest with you guys i love her character <laughs> i love amiko's character in uh in in the the green arrow mythos because i don't know if i've been saying green lantern up to this point i hope i haven't i feel like i have but uh green arrow is what i what i mean to say but i love the character of amiko now she is the daughter of a woman named shadow and shadow has been around for a long time in fact i think she first came out with longbow hunters by mike grell um but shadow was introduced as a woman who essentially had an affair with oliver queen's father with robert queen and you know she ended up producing amiko now much like damian wayne in the batman mythos where damian was trained by the league of assassins and then eventually handed over to bruce wayne um with amiko she's similar but a little bit different in the sense that she was largely trained by her mother you know as part of shadow and her, her skill set and so on and so forth but she actually defected she actually turned against her mother and allied herself with oliver queen and effectively became his new protege now this was designed to be a kind of stand-in for the arsenal you know red arrow uh, dichotomy that we had seen in the oliver queen stories prior to the new 52 but to be honest it worked i mean i liked it i liked seeing the character of amiko uh, with regards to how she related to oliver queen because you know she was related to him but not in a traditional sense she wasn't a biological sister she was really more of a half sister and she was trying to find her place in the world but in this particular story or at least you know in this opening scene she's very similar to oliver in terms of how she views the world and the, the steps she's willing to go to and her belief systems you know in line with him in terms of being a traditional hero now the other cool thing about this is again benjamin percy's kind of giving us this tour of oliver queen and dc rebirth and he goes on to basically have him uh go alongside black canary and say hey look here's how i do things now this is effectively benjamin percy saying hey guys for those of you who are watching the green arrow tv show this is not the green arrow tv show more so than that oliver queen is not batman this is one of the biggest debates in the history of comic books especially when people start to look at the two characters in terms of how they function their origin stories how they became who they were and when they look at the uh, green arrow tv show the idea of you know bruce 
Wayne and Oliver Queen, how similar they are, but also how different they are. With the character of Batman, he threatens you with, you know, with harm. If, when Batman comes knocking on your door, you know, when he shows up, knock on wood, <laughs> and he comes knocking on your door and he says, I need information, uh, you can either give it to him or you can probably have your arms broken or something like that. With Oliver Queen, again, he just throws money at everything. But in terms of the public faces, in terms of their public personas, you know, Oliver Queen does some great things. This is what he tells Black Canary. He says, look, I do great things for the city of Seattle. You know, I do amazing things here. You know, I basically provide um, a place for the homeless to stay. You know, I have a children's hospital for children who would otherwise not be able to afford the kind of treatment that they need in order to, you know, cure them or whatever was ailing them. You know, he was like, I provide restoration efforts so kids have baseball fields. You know, I have homes for women to escape abusive situations. I have invested in this city to make it a beautiful place for those individuals who are in need of help. Now, Black Canary's response to this is like, yeah, but you just did it with money. I mean, there's no one in your life right now that you can genuinely count on uh, that you haven't bought or paid for. Now, this is also Benjamin Percy touching on the idea of Team Arrow. Now, we'll see them come back. We'll see like John Diggle. We'll see Henry Fife. You know, we'll see those guys play a more major role. Henry V will be in this, and he was in the beginning of the story, but we'll see him play a more prominent role. But we'll basically see the reformation of Team Arrow uh, in terms of Oliver Queen having his own, you know, little group to fight alongside in uh, in Seattle. But again, you know, because of the fact that Black Canary doesn't really see eye to eye with him, initially the indication here is that she starts to walk away. Now again, we'll also see this come to its fruition in terms of what it is that she's doing in this situation, but the idea is that Oliver Queen also had come to the realization that the shipping containers uh, that had been used to send these various people people to wherever it is, you know, the underground men were sending him to, uh, belong to Queen Industries. It was basically his company's shipping containers. And so what he does is he goes to his secretary, a woman named Wendy, and he basically says, hey, look, you know, I need all the records you can find me on, you know, investments, on money that we're spending, on on how all this is coming along, basically the entire financial side of all of Queen Industries. And so once he gets this information, what he does is he travels to meet his CFO. Now on the surface, Oliver CFO seems like a pretty straight up and legitimate guy. And in truth, I mean, we know what direction this is heading in. Like just by virtue of this, we know the CFO is going to be up to no good. And that's kind of the cool thing here is because Benjamin Percy realizes that, hey, as you're reading through a comic, you're just going to figure things out on your own. So why not just cater the comic that way? You know, why not just reveal the most obvious thing, but also build up to something greater and something bigger? And so what happens is that, you know, once Oliver sits down and talks to a CFO and says, hey, look, you know, I've been going through what's been happening with Queen Industries on the financial side. And what I'm seeing are escrow accounts. I'm seeing duplicate invoices. I'm seeing diverted funds. He's seeing everything that seems to indicate embezzlement and that the financial side is being manipulated for something else beyond what Queen Industries Charter mandates in terms of being a, uh, a beacon for financial success in Seattle itself. And so, of course, we have the CFO just kind of blowing things off. You know, he's like, hey, look, you know, we'll get to this here in a minute. We've had some major issue go on. I'm going to go focus on that. And then we'll have this discussion. The problem with this is that once Oliver Queen leaves, the CFO makes the call and says, it's time to take Oliver Queen out. And so, of course, he's initially bombarded with a whole host of arrows, you know, once he uh, gets back into his place. But then we also learn that him being attacked is uh, done by Shadow herself. Now, of course, Shadow, again, is, is kind of this long-running enemy of Green Arrow, and this is the two of them have bumped heads, you know, consistently. But we also learn the CFO himself is the head of the Underground Men, or at least seems to be the head of the Underground Men. You know, at the very least, he was the face that we had seen during the uh, Green Arrow Rebirth story when we saw, you know, Oliver Queen and Black Canary talking to whoever it was that was on the screen, auctioning these people off and saying, hey, look, you know, we're going to come and find you and we're going to bring you down. And so, you know, when he steps in and when he attempts to uh, take down Shadow, he suddenly met with the arrival of Amiko. Now, of course, his initial idea is, hey, you know, Amiko, you got to help me out. <laughs> you can't let me get killed by Shadow. You can't let me be defeated. But instead, Amiko seems to turn against him and kill Oliver Queen. And so this created a, a really crazy situation because the idea is like, well, where do you go from here? You know, what, what do you do in a situation like this with Oliver Queen being killed? Well, you follow the story to its most logical conclusion. And so what happens here is we pick up with Shadow and Amiko, where they're basically taking the body of Oliver Queen and they're taking his boat out into the Puget Sound. And the effect just toss him overboard. And the idea here is going to be that they're going to look at the life of Oliver Queen in terms of people perceiving him as a party boy, people perceiving him as a guy that liked the high, you know, the jet set life, the fast paced lifestyle with drugs, alcohol, women, so on and so forth. They're going to paint that picture of him. And then they're going to use that as a way to effectively discredit him and bring him down in his entirety. And so from here, we actually jump to Abu Dhabi and we pick up with John Diggle. Now, to be honest with you guys, I haven't really followed the Green Arrow mythos long enough to know that much about John Diggle.
Indigo, but what I'm aware of, at least what I've been able to tell, and those of you guys uh, who are really familiar with Green Arrow, feel free to post comments down below and correct me if I'm wrong so that people have a, a correct understanding of him. But as far as I'm aware, John Diggle was introduced in issue number 23, I think it was, of the Green Arrow run by Jeff Lanier and Sorrentino. It was a way to basically take the familiarity of the TV show and throw it into the comics. But he had also become part of Team Arrow for a time and eventually left, but we don't really know what he was doing after he left. As far as I'm aware, he basically just took off and then DC launched DC Rebirth. And so, um, you know, I don't think there's been any indication of what's been going on between the time that he left Green Arrow and right here. But what we know is that he's basically leading some sort of a client out of Abu Dhabi, or at the very least seems to be taking him away when suddenly they're set upon by people from a multitude of different directions. Now, he also is, or at least it seems like a message is sent to him, uh, basically saying to avenge Oliver Queen's death, follow Knut's money to the ninth circle. And so this seems to be somebody sending him a message saying, hey, look, Oliver Queen's been killed. Now, the question here is, will John Diggle get involved? Because again, as far as I'm aware, they left, you know, John Diggle and, and Green Arrow split on bad terms. They split on terms that were not conducive to maintaining a healthy relationship between the two. And so following this, we of course have Black Canary learning of Oliver Queen's death, because again, this is all behind the scenes. She wasn't aware of everything that was going on. Not only that, you know, the picture again that's being painted here by the press, by the CFO, is that Oliver Queen's life was, it was jet set, it was partying, it was alcohol, it was drugs. It was only a matter of time before he did something stupid and got himself killed. And so even if it's only in the public eye, uh, Oliver Queen's reputation has been smeared. But in truth, when it comes to running a company, when it comes to running any corporation, uh, the court of public opinion is really the court that brings you down or keeps you up. And that's all it really takes is for Oliver Queen's reputation to be smeared in the public eye. And then suddenly Oliver Queen's not as great as he used to be. The only way for this to really be rectified is for Oliver Queen to return from the dead. And so what we have is basically Black Canary trying to figure things out. Now, at the same time that this happens, we also have Henry Fife, who again, kind of played this role of Felicity Smoke in the Green Arrow comics. He's the guy kind of, you know, the hidden hand behind the scenes, the Intel guy. Uh, he's of course outraged at the idea, you know, that Oliver Queen may have been killed, but more so than that, he also picks up on a homing beacon of Oliver Queen's body. Now, when he gets there, and he of course is just playing video games or whatever it is that he does in his spare time, but then he's suddenly hit with a homing beacon for, uh, or at least it seems to be for Amiko. And so the question is, you know, did something happen to Amiko? Is there something taking place out in the Puget Sound? When he gets out there, he finds that Oliver Queen's actually dead. He finds his body just laying, you know, in shambles uh, on this shore. And so because of this, you know, his immediate idea is to panic. His immediate idea is to freak out. But then we end up switching with Oliver Queen as he comes to. <laughs> so Oliver Queen is very much alive here. And in truth, we would expect him to be. We wouldn't expect Oliver Queen to actually be killed. We would expect him to live. More so than that, it was the grandma of Henry that had basically restored Oliver Queen's health, brought him back, uh, essentially kept him alive in terms of making sure that, you know, he was able to recover from his injuries. The downside to this is that Oliver Queen has effectively lost everything. I mean, everything he has is gone. His money is gone. His bank accounts are all, all shut down. Um, you know, his company doesn't belong to him anymore. His home has been demolished. I mean, everything that makes him who he is, is completely vacant. And so he's basically back to square one. He's back down to zero and he's got to work his way back up again. And this is the conclusion that he comes to. He says, look, in this situation that I'm in right now, everybody that I knew is gone. You know, John Diggle is gone. Henry Fife is gone. You know, I mean, when he contacts Henry and says, hey, look, you know, I need you to help me find some stuff. Henry says, hey, look, man, I wish I could, but I got bills to pay, you know, and if you can't pay me, then I can't help you. Now, again, this is Benjamin Percy basically saying Oliver Queen's kingdom was built on sand. All it would take is for him to lose his money and it all comes crashing down. All of his resources, all those people that were helping him, all the cops being on his side, it was all done by money. But when the money dries up, there's no one there anymore. And so because of that, he's effectively on his own. And he says that if there's no one else there, you know, if Oliver Queen is effectively dead in terms of his company, in terms of his home, in terms of the people that care about him, then the only person left alive is the Green Arrow. And so this is really just Oliver Queen going back to his roots, being the guy that we all know and love. Now, this is where things begin to change in terms of the comics design. It was actually a little sad to see the previous artist leave, but we did end up grabbing, um, I want to say his name is Juan Fer Ferre Ferreira. I'm not sure how you pronounce his last name, but in truth, I think his art's actually a little bit better here. But with Oliver Queen, it's the idea of him breaking into his own facility and trying to bring it down or at the very least, find out what happened to all the money that belonged to him. Now, the other half of this is that because of the fact that Oliver Queen helped to develop Queen Industries, the building itself, he's well aware of its security systems. And so getting through there isn't that big of a challenge. You know, getting through there isn't that difficult to do. Instead, it's really more of him trying to bypass security as him trying to deal with the various forces that are there. But once he makes his way to the penthouse, then he's suddenly met with a CFO. And a CFO says, yeah, man, I'm the one that did this to you. I'm the one that cost you everything. Now, this is actually kind of big because usually the revelation of the hidden hand behind the downfall of a hero isn't usually done until the end of the story. And so the fact that we're getting this halfway through is an indication that, you know, Benjamin Percy has much bigger plans for Green Arrow. He has much bigger plans for the direction that the comic is going to take, whether it's in this story arc or whether it's in 
in a future story arc. Not only that, we of course see the CFO talking about how he is a board member of what amounts to a bank. Now, the Ninth Circle is not some organization like, like the Court of Owls. The Ninth Circle is not some organization bent on world domination. Instead, the Ninth Circle is perfectly content operating behind the scenes, much like Marvel's, you know, Hellfire Club, but their goal is to acquire wealth. Their goal is to acquire money and to basically be a place where all the supervillains of the world can go to in order to hide their money, in order to move product, in order to uh, to basically carry out their normal goals, depending on what those goals happen to be. And so they're, they're trying to center themselves or position themselves really as like the center of the world's criminal empires. And, and the reason why is because there will always be criminals. If the Ninth Circle is effectively the center of the criminal empire in terms of people keeping all their resources hidden, then it means that they will be in business forever. Until the time comes when all the supervillains are eradicated off the face of the earth, there will always be a need for, you know, the shell companies and the offshore accounts that the Ninth Circle will provide. And so they'll make themselves essential to the market of supervillains, which is actually a pretty genius concept when you think about it in the realm of comic books and in the realm of just the DC universe and comic book universes in and of itself, is to make yourself an essential part of the criminal organization by providing resources. It actually works really, really well, and I really like it. But again, you know, we have Benjamin Percy switching over to Black Canary, and again, she's basically on the hunt for Oliver Queen, because again, she doesn't know that he's alive. As far as she's aware, he's dead, and she's on the track or on the hunt for the people who likely killed him. Not only that, she also has this idea, or at least in terms of how she's depicted, that she's very much Batman-esque. She's the opposite of Green Arrow in terms of how she carries herself out. Green Arrow, you know, and she even goes as far as to tell one of the dock workers, look, you know, Green Arrow paid you for your information, but she says, my currency is pain, and I am not short on the money that I run that I will cause you so much pain if you do not give me the information that I need. And it's actually really cool to see this, because I think that with regards to the character of Black Canary, as part of the Birds of Prey, it wasn't bad, it wasn't terrible. I was never partial to the Birds of Prey, at least before DC Rebirth. It's actually pretty interesting right now with what we're seeing, but, you know, Black Canary never really got any on her own development time. Now, of course, she's not getting a lot of that here, but she's getting enough that we're looking at her character and understanding exactly where she stands in relation to Green Arrow. And it's a really good dichotomy, to be honest, to really have her as the kind of person that's very similar to Batman in terms of how she gains information versus Green Arrow, who just kind of throws money at all of his problems. But the fact remains here, you know, switching over to Inferno, this is when Benjamin Percy really begins to invoke a lot of the concepts of uh, Dante Alighieri's uh, Divine Comedy, you know, uh, Dante's Inferno or the, the Nine Circles of Hell. Now, of course, that, that's a, a very traditional sense in terms of how hell and purgatory and heaven are depicted. But the idea is that they're effectively kind of spiraling down these nine circles. You know, they're they're going all the way down these different circles, you know, to the very bottom when it comes to traitors. And that's really what the story is for the most part, is it's kind of a journey down the circles of hell in Dante's Inferno, you know, leading down to absolute treachery, leading down to the betrayal, you know, of one friend over another in some form or fashion. So again, it's really just kind of Oliver Queen and it's just, it's really Black Canary trying to get things sorted out. Now, Black Canary eventually comes to the realization that with these shipping containers being sent off to whatever it is that the underground men go to, the most logical thing is to board one of these shipping containers to stow away and follow it to its destination. Not only that, we also have the leader of the underground men who looks to the idea of Shadow as being a failure because of the fact that he's become aware of Oliver Queen being alive. Now, the idea is to initially impose her penalty on uh, Shadow's daughter, Amiko. The issue with this is that Amiko proves herself to be very capable in terms of her abilities. And what she says is, look, Neil, Oliver Queen, yes, he's alive, but we don't need to go find him. We don't need to hunt for him. What we need to do is take something he values. And what she says is Black Canary is on her way here, stowing away on a vessel. Why Black Canary thought it was a good idea to stow away on a vessel in the open air doesn't make any sense to me. You think she'd just hide away somewhere until the vessel arrives, you know, and then emerge. But for whatever reason, she chose to just stand on the highest point of the ship where she would easily be spotted with Amiko coming to the realization that she's there and saying, when Black Canary gets here, all we have to do is capture her, let Green Arrow know that we have her and he'll come to us, which is actually really, really smart in terms of trying to capture him. It's a classic example of just using bait. Instead of chasing what you want, instead of chasing the rat around the house, you just set cheese and the rat will come to you. And so what happens is we pick up with this, you know, with more or less this conclusion of the story, the way that uh, Benjamin Percy writes this, and it actually comes out pretty good. It comes out pretty solid in the sense that, um, you know, with Oliver Queen having, you know, detonated an explosion in the Queen Industries building, that as soon as he emerges and once he takes this laptop that belonged to his CFO that has all this financial information with regards to the underground men, um, the cops initially try to step in. And this is really where Benjamin Percy again says, all the help that Oliver Queen had was bought and paid for, but all it would take is for somebody to pay better. And suddenly Oliver Queen's resources are gone. And that's exactly what happens here. You know, because of the fact that Green Arrow has been ousted, because he's more or less been shut out of the system, because of the fact that these cops are now being paid for with better money, then it means that they're no longer on his side anymore. And so he's effectively a vigilante, a true vigilante inside his own city. Not only that, we also have uh, John Diggle meeting up with Oliver Queen for the first time in DC Rebirth. 
remember. Now again, uh, to be honest, it's a little disappointing with regards to this first encounter because we don't get any information. It's the two of them just kind of fighting one another and John Diggle saying things like, you know, a lot's changed with him over the course of the last year. But as far as I'm aware, again, there's been no explanation on what it is that John Diggle's been through since he left. And so the question is, what happened? What took place here that led to such a, a strong rivalry between the two? But eventually, it really seemed to be more like, uh, you know, John Diggle working out his frustration, you know, and then eventually allying himself with Oliver Queen and the two of them kind of becoming friends again. And so to be honest, this felt a little bit rushed. I kind of felt like it could have been paced out a little more, but within the confines of this story arc, it makes more sense. And we may see, you know, a story that fleshes things out a little bit more later on down the line. But for right now, it's really just kind of the first step to returning Team Arrow back to its previous status quo. And so of course, from here, we also switch to Black Canary arriving at Inferno, the home base of the underground men as they're being led by this guy. Of course, again, you know, she's also taken prisoner. You know, she's hit with a tranquilizer dart and taken down, but it's also her coming to the realization that Amiko seems to have been working and seems to have been the one that killed Oliver Queen in the sense that Amiko's now allied herself directly with her mother's shadow and the underground men themselves. And so again, this is really just Benjamin Percy kind of winding everything down, uh, but it's also Benjamin Percy saying, hey guys, look, the team Arrow's coming back in the sense that John Diggle and Oliver Queen travel to the apartment of Henry Fife. And they basically put him in a situation where they're like, hey, look, man, you know, you can't walk away from this. You know, we need your help on this. This is something that's much, much bigger. You know, this goes extremely deep. And so once Henry Fife begins to go through this, he also starts to come to the realization that with all the information on this laptop that, you know, Oliver Queen being the face of Queen Industries allowed the CFO to basically fund the underground man without anybody asking any questions. Because if Oliver Queen was a philanthropist, if he was throwing money at great causes, then what reason would anybody have to say, well, I wonder if he's also funding like terrorism. Like, I wonder if he's also doing that. No one would ask that. No one would have a reason to because they would look at Oliver Queen as this bright beacon of how great of a place Seattle is to live, considering all the resources that its needy citizens are getting. And so once they start to go through all these different records, they realize that the Ninth Circle is in everything. I mean, their hands are in everything. They fund terrorist groups. They basically, you know, fund presidential campaigns. They decide who gets elected, who doesn't. I mean, there's all kinds of things, you know, the, the Falcone family, the Yakuza, the Ninth Circle is involved in everything around the world from Gotham City to Metropolis, you know, the whole nine yards. It's, it's this thing everywhere, which is one of the reasons why we had actually seen a representative from the Parliament of Owls in Green Arrow Rebirth number one, because the Parliament of Owls was working alongside the Ninth Circle. And so again, this is Benjamin Percy saying, hey guys, Green Arrow Rebirth is not in isolation. It's not alone. It's not some out there in left field story. It ties very much into everything that's going on. And so it actually works out pretty well. Not only that, while they're going through this laptop, they're suddenly met with a message from the Ninth Circle and they say, hey, we got Black Canary. <laughs> <laughs> you can come out here and grab her, uh, but when you do, we're gonna take you out. And so Oliver Queen's in a tough situation. You know, the idea of Oliver Queen is to either allow himself to die trying to rescue Black Canary or form some plan that can get Black Canary to safety, uh, but also ensure his own survival. Now, of course, because of the fact that Henry is such a tech guy, he's able to trace the, the source uh, of the message as it was sent to them, which allows Oliver and uh, John Diggle to head over to Inferno and basically break in in an effort to rescue Black Canary. Now, again, this is really just Benjamin Percy just, just sort of ending things. I mean, things wrap up pretty fast here in the sense that with Black Canary being taken prisoner, uh, Shadow initially goes to Amiko and says, hey, look, you know, you're my daughter. In the world that she lived in, the world that Shadow lived in, she experienced really nothing but death and suffering. But when she had an affair with Robert Queen and when she gave birth to Amiko, Amiko was proof that life could exist, that beautiful things could exist in a world of so much darkness. And so the birth of Amiko very much saved Shadow from falling into a cesspool of self-destruction and self-loathing. And so because of this, you know, she basically says, I want you to truly become my daughter, you know, we need to kill Black Canary. And so, you know, once she gets into the situation, once Amiko makes her way over and seems to uh, get ready to kill Black Canary, she takes her mask off and we realize that Amiko's actually been working against the underground man the entire time. From the time that she first shot Oliver Queen with a tranquilizer dart up until, you know, right now, she's always been on the side of Oliver Queen. She's never been against him. It was the idea of allowing herself to infiltrate the underground man and take them down from the inside out, which is a genius plan. And in fact, when Oliver Queen first shows up, this is what this is what she tells him. You know, when they first encounter one another, Oliver Queen immediately tries to attack Amiko because remember, in his mind, she's bad. I mean, she's the one that presumably killed him or at the very least took him out so that his empire could be brought down around him. But what she says is, look, you know, I'm, I'm the one that contacted John Diggle in order to send him a coded message to let him know that you died. I'm the one that allowed Henry Fife to decrypt everything that was on that laptop and I'm the one that allowed him to know where it was Inferno was operating out of. You know, I've been working with you instead of shooting you with an 
it with an arrow that would kill you, I shot you with a tranquilizer arrow so everybody would think that you were dead. I'm the reason why you're alive, and I'm the reason why you were able to get here along with allies. Now, this is really, really, really cool. This is why I love the character of Amiko because I wasn't expecting this. <laughs> I didn't think Oliver Queen was going to die. You know, I didn't think that Oliver Queen was going to lose his empire forever, but I didn't think that Benjamin Percy was going to come back and say, actually, Amiko was working on your side the entire time. I never saw that coming. I actually thought it was it was really funny. One of the other really funny things here, this is why I love Benjamin Percy's writing so much. One of the other really funny things here is Oliver comes into contact with Black Canary again. He effectively rescues her, you know, and she, she slaps the shit out of him. <laughs> Now, the reason why is because of the two of them previously fought, you know, and Oliver said, hey, look, you wanted some space. You know, she said, well, that's what I do. I push people away. It's your job to not let me go. It's your job to come and get me, you know, and to, to keep me here. Now, this is kind of her playing hard to get. I mean, in truth, in the real world, if I was in a situation like this with a chick, I would be like, well, then you just need to leave. Like, you just need to go. Like, I'm not, I'm not playing hard to get playing games. That's not my thing. But, you know, for Oliver, he cares enough about her that it's not that huge of a situation. So, you know, while they're kind of doing this greeting while they're kissing, basically, you know, embracing Embracing one another and, and being uh, brought back together again, they also try to break their way out. The problem with this is that Shadow grabs Amigo, you know, knocks her out with a tranquilizer arrow and just runs off. And so now Oliver Queen is short one of his team. Not only that, you know, it's his half sister. And so this really leaves the door open. At least it seems like it leaves the stage open for Oliver Queen to begin another conquest to try to get his half sister back. And so what happens is, of course, again, you know, things move pretty fast here. Not a whole lot to offer in terms of exposition. It's really just the group getting away. The problem with this is that in the midst of this massive explosion, in the midst of everything going to pieces, you know, suddenly we have Black Canary and we have John Diggle uh, leaving leaving Oliver Queen behind. At least it doesn't seem to be intended. It just kind of seems to be something that was accidental. But the result here is that with the, the bridge collapsing, with Oliver Queen not being able to make it to the boat in time, he basically just kind of ends up in the water. But as he, you know, passes out and eventually he comes to, he washes up on the shore of the same island, or at least it seems like the same island he had previously ended up on, you know, during his character's origin story when he was transitioning from being shipwrecked to eventually becoming the green arrow but with that being said we're going to bring this video to an end if you guys are new here to comics explain be sure to hit the subscribe button to become part of the rob core if you guys enjoy this video drop a like and i will catch you all later peace